and welcome to the Good Girl Confessional podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Lowries. And of course, the Good Girl Confessional is proudly brought to you by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine. I will premise this episode with a trigger warning. This episode explores topics including domestic violence, abuse, murder, grief, and loss. Please listen at your own discretion. If you find this podcast to be triggering, please do seek support and we will put some references in the show notes below. Today on the podcast, I am honoured to be chatting with Amani Hayda, former lawyer, artist, advocate and author of her incredible memoir, The Mother Wound. While the loss of a parent is always difficult, Amani's mother was taken from her, murdered by her father. Amani joins us to talk about her incredible book, The Mother Wound, and share her story of living through and beyond tragedy, the ongoing impact of domestic violence on her family, and the resilience of women. Please welcome to The Confessional, Amani Hayda. Hello, Amani, and welcome to The Good Girl Confessional. How are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. How are you going in lockdown? Because it's lockdown everywhere now. Yeah, well, we're doing okay. I've got a kindergarten um, aged daughter and we've, we're have we doing remote learning learning for the first time because last year she was in um, preschool. So we're adjusting to that, but otherwise we're doing okay. I'm a bit disappointed that a lot of book events have been cancelled in the next month, and but what can you do? I think this is the best for everybody, so... Yeah, yeah, very true. Although it's uh, it's had a huge impact, as you mentioned just then, on everyone in the arts and as you know, as as an author yourself, um, yeah, um, it must be difficult to then have book launches and book events actually um, shut down. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, is that I saw that you had um, an art exhibition actually down here in Melbourne, and you had to zoom in. How did it go? Yeah, it went well. Um, that was my first commercial exhibition and also my first Melbourne exhibition. So I was pretty excited about it. Um, really disappointed that I couldn't be there in person. I was really looking forward to it. It's always exciting to actually see the works hanging in the space because there's something about it all coming together um, in that moment and the way people interact with it. It's pretty special. Um, but we were able to organize for Naya Dole to interview me um, via video. So that worked out well and I think we did the best we could do in the circumstances and, you know, you roll with the punches, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, isn't it? <laughs> We've all sort of had to learn to adjust. It's, it's a strange world. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, your art is absolutely beautiful and um uh, you know, obviously with this podcast, we will share all of your links, but your links to your Instagram page where people can actually look at your beautiful art. Thank you. It's it's a joy to create work for people to enjoy. And yeah, I love doing it. It's just incredible. So maybe we'll start there because your journey and your story is pretty incredible. Um, but maybe we'll start with, you know, you are a lawyer and you then moved into being an artist and that in in and of itself is a huge kind of shift. So how did that happen for you? Yeah, so basically up until um, around the beginning of 2015, I was practicing as a commercial litigation solicitor in the city at a big-ish firm where I had started as a summer clerk. It's a highly sought after kind of opportunity. So um, it was, you know, something I had thrown myself into and dedicated myself to. And even though I'd always been a creative person, I'd never thought of art as anything more than a hobby. And I grew up with parents who had traditional views around success and what you should do with the opportunities available to you and how you should establish yourself and create um, security and stability for your future. So it had been ingrained in me that you, that a traditional career path was one of the most valuable things that you could have. Um, after losing my mum to DV in 2015 and experiencing the legal system in a different way from the perspective of a um, victim as a witness, um, I started to query whether the law was really 
the ideal forum for seeking justice and sharing stories that are complex and nuanced. And um, I leaned into my creativity and I was um, pregnant and having my first child and then pregnant again and having my second child. So at home a lot. And um, I found that if I, if, if I spent a bit of time creating each day, I felt a sense of satisfaction that I wouldn't really get from other activities. And I started to build that into a regular um, discipline and a part of my routine that, I, you know, just kind of grew and grew until I thought, you know what, why not do this? Why can't this be part of what I do in the long term? And why not, you know, push myself to think differently about what um, a career should look like, um, what kind of stories you can tell in what, you know, and, and how to engage the public and do things that are, that are beautiful and creative and engaging and powerful um, in a different way to what, I, what I'd always assumed was the best way or the only way to do it. Yeah, wow. Um, and, you know, what you created is a body of work which is just beautiful. Um, and, you know, some of it is very raw and it, it, it's just beautiful, very colourful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been um, really nice to be able to give myself the time and space to create. And there's there are women that I come across who are like, you know what, I was creative when I was young and I pushed that aside because I was, you know, supposed to look after the house or have children or, you know, the kids won't let me paint. And I'm like, okay, there's ways around that. Let's, let's harness it. Everybody has creativity and you just don't know when it's going to sort of manifest or what's going to be the medium that works for you. So it's, it's yeah. been great going on that journey. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's very true. And as a creative myself as a writer, I guess, um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing that women do tend to put ourselves last, you know, it's like the house and the family, the children, parents, whoever it may be. Um, and it's difficult, I think, for a lot of women, and we talk about this a lot sort of in the Good Girl Confessional and at Women Beyond 40 magazine, that it is difficult for women sometimes to give themselves permission to create a space for themselves to be creative or to have time out or give themselves a little bit of me time. Definitely. And um, I was at an event recently where they were talking about the concept of the creative genius and how men throughout history have been able to hold themselves away and create an event and then, you know, be given that title of genius or, you know, but what, what kinds of duties did they fail to, to meet during that time? And how are women caught up doing those things behind the scenes um, and effectively facilitating these geniuses? And when do we get to hold ourselves away? When do we get to say, you know what, today I'm going to go <laughs> into my man shed and, and <laughs> paint all day because I've got some ideas that I want to explore. That's a really hard thing to carve out space for and carve out time for. And um, I've, I've really, you know, had to be creative about how to be creative because <laughs> it won't happen on its own. And it's a lot of work to, you know, make sure that you give yourself the opportunity to, to write or paint or do whatever it is that you need to pursue. Yeah, agreed. And, and, you know, that's different things for different people, but I do think, um, you know, it is that sense of give yourself permission to do something that actually makes your heart sing that mm -hmm. actually makes you feel a little bit more whole. And I think that that's a beautiful message. Um, especially more difficult, I think, to be a painter when you've got young children at home, I would imagine. But I think it's fabulous that you are carving out that time and doing that for yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's great to, for the kids to witness as well, because, you know, firstly, you're providing an example of mother, motherhood that doesn't just revolve around um, their needs or the housework. They can see that you're multidimensional as a person. Um, and also they get to see the work as it's being conceived and created and in all its different steps. And then I take them to the exhibition at the end and they see it hanging somewhere in the public, which I think is an amazing thing for a child to be exposed to that their work might one day, um, you know, be valued and celebrated and they can sort of make things happen from almost nothing, you know, the bare minimum, the materials that are available. So I think it's great for kids to witness that and it's, it just enriches our lives. Yeah. I think it's so important. I agree. I mean, I've got three children. They're um, they're more grown up now. My baby's about to turn twenty-one. Good grief! But um, 
but I think it's really important. And I think that you're right as a mother myself for them to witness through the years that I've written and I've done things and I've created a magazine and I do a podcast or whatever it may be, um, is important for them because that they witness, as you say, like their mother is not just their mum, but a woman and a human and someone out there in the real world as well. Not just someone who does the washing. Definitely. So really important. Yeah, yep, definitely. <laughs> Um, I'm so grateful that you've come on today to talk about your extraordinary book, um, which you have written, which is your true life story, uh, called The Mother Wound. And I wonder if you can tell our listeners about the book and the journey. Um, and I'm very mindful of the fact that this is your truth and it is a, a true story. So please do take your time and I'm excited to hear it in your words. Yeah, so basically the the book is a culmination of experiences and thoughts and reflections and um, a lot of grief um, as well as I think a lot of love and, you know, reflection on family and justice um, that has come together over the past few years for me. So I... As a, I didn't think of myself as a writer um, when I, you know, a few years ago when I was navigating the legal profession and motherhood and things like that. But I needed to appear um, at my father's trial as a witness. Um, so basically, my mum was murdered in March 2015. My dad was then um, charged and he, we had to proceed to trial because he was pleading um, not guilty by reason of mental impairment. Um, we and the prosecutor obviously um, didn't agree that, that that was an accurate reflection of the facts. Um, so we all found ourselves in the courtroom and it was something that I was kind of wishing I wouldn't have to do. Um, and the courtroom can be such a disempowering experience for victims, as we know, and so many women are coming out and talking about their experiences of um, how that's played out in, you know, child sexual um, abuse cases, how that's worked out for them in workplace sexual harassment cases and things like that. So I was conscious that, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be the most empowering experience, but it was the only hope we had at the time of some sort of accountability, some sort of process to kind of reflect our loss and our grief. Um, I remember my first counselling session after the murder with an organisation called the Homicide Victims Support Group. And I, I actually asked the counsellor immediately, will I get to give a victim impact statement? Because I knew that that was one of the mechanisms that, um, in fact, I think a lot of feminists had fought for in the 70s, um, so that women in particular, but you know, all victims of crime would have the opportunity to talk about how they'd been impacted and for a moment experience the kind of validation that you don't get out in the world. So I, in a way, even though I was dreading the whole of the trial, the opportunity of giving a victim impact statement, talking in my own words, writing something, um, was a little bit of, um, a thing to hold on to, a way of kind of reclaiming a bit of a voice in the proceedings where you're you're actually not a party, you know, you're not really in control of anything that plays out. It's like a theatre, you know. Um, so that seemed to me, you know, a little chance, a small chance to say something. And it would be really difficult, um, you know, g going to trial ended up being really difficult because it was the first time I was confronting my dad since before the murder. So two years had lapsed. We'd had to wait a long time. There were certain things I couldn't discuss with my sisters, you know, to maintain the integrity of our evidence. Um, and I ended up being cross-examined by his barrister, which was um, a very confronting experience that I set out in the book because I really wanted to bring readers along and let them, I guess, experience that with me um, through, through the story. And when I gave my victim impact statement at the end of the trial and I was like, that's it, I don't have to be here anymore and I've got a little bit off my chest, I kind of, it dawned on me that that was never going to cover everything. That was a short um, document, a brief experience. It was governed by certain rules. You can't really directly address the offender. You can't sort of include every little um, 
reflection and there is no way you can capture all your pain and the complexity of your experiences in that one um, moment. So it became increasingly clear to me as I was engaging with literature from other women, um, thinking about, you know, how do I tell more of my mum's story that I needed to write? And I'd started writing initially um, journaling because my counsellor had suggest- suggested it to me. I was experiencing a lot of anger that was sort of disrupting my daily life. Um, and journaling became a way of working through those thoughts. And the more I did it, the more I was like, okay, I think I need to write more. And it grew and grew and grew. And then I you know, published a couple of articles and I started to really work towards um, you know, putting everything together in a memoir. Yeah, wow. And what an exceptional memoir it is as well, by the way. Um, Thank you. I think, you know, one of the things that struck me straight away was, A, what an extraordinary writer you are, Um, but your ability to bring the reader into your world because it's a really difficult story. Um, It's a difficult, you know, for us, one can only imagine you know, when you're reading it, how difficult that must have been to experience it and live it and to still live with the impacts of that even today, of course. Um, So tell us about your mum and who she was, um, because I think one of the things that is really important, and I know this comes through in your book as well, is that she's a human being, she's a person, she's a woman, um, and her story is important as well. Yeah, so... My mum was born in the south of Lebanon. She grew up um, under Israeli occupation. She loved to read. She loved school. Um, She had friends. She loved to play in the garden. And she was one of nine children. Um, So she had this big family um, and most of them were girls. And uh, eventually for women in that place during that time, there are such limited opportunities, especially during war, um, to travel, to get a university education was near impossible because if your family could afford to send someone, they'll send a boy or the oldest child. Um, It wasn't socially acceptable for women to live on their own in the city. Beirut was about four hours away from her village, so it was almost inaccessible. There were all these different factors And at the same time, a lot of people were leaving Lebanon and um, seeking, you know, safety for their lives in other places. And my mum had just finished school when she met my dad and he'd been living in Australia for 10 years. So it seemed like a, you know, an exciting opportunity for someone who doesn't know what they're going to do next. Um, You know, meeting someone who seems kind of impressive and um, whose family is familiar to your own family. Um, there's a there's a sense of trust, I guess, that goes into those um, circumstances. And when she came to Australia, even though she was really disappointed by, by what, the type of person my dad turned out to be, she did some amazing things. So after having four kids, she went to TAFE. She did her um, various courses, uh, built up her language skills, built up all her different networks, did her diploma, and then um, went on to work in community um, community welfare as a social worker, as a caseworker with refugees. Um, and at the time of her death, she was working as a counsellor on the quit line, and she was one of only two Arabic-speaking um, counsellors on the New South Wales quit line, helping people to quit smoking. And um, she was also training up to support people through other forms of drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and she was enrolled in university doing a bachelor's of social work at Western Sydney Uni. So she was a very vibrant person. And I think sometimes when we think of victims of crime or we read headlines, we imagine these women to be sort of um, weak and lacking in agency or one-dimensional and their life is reduced to this awful moment about how it ended and all the beautiful things that they did and they achieved despite barriers throughout their lives are totally forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hence why I wanted really to, to hear you talk about your mum um, because, you know, she sounds like such an extraordinary person. I'm sure she was. Um, um, and that's exactly right. I think that 
media and society tends to narrow down this view of what does a woman look like who's in a domestic violence situation. Um, and they assume, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's so complex and it's so nuanced and it's so layered. Um, you know, my mother, you know, when I was very young, removed herself from my biological father and was in a domestic violence situation and it wasn't pleasant. Um, and she got out of that and ended up married to my stepfather, who's a lovely man who was, he's passed away now. Um, but yeah, I think it's very nuanced. And I think people, a lot of people don't really understand that I think there's a beautiful moment in your book actually where you talk about um you've you've gone somewhere for an appointment and you look up and there's a picture of your mum on a poster um because of the work that she did you know I suppose it was a promotional poster for health yeah. services that must have been extraordinary yeah so I'll, I'll share that story people yeah. will, can can read it in more detail in the book but um yeah it was this amazing moment where it was the day immediately after the murder and I was five months pregnant and it was my first child and I was not feeling well at all. Um, and I, I, you know, understandably so. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I had no idea how to respond to the physical sensations of grief. You know, it was a very physical experience. You think it's kind of going to be like this thing in your head or in your emotions, but I was feeling physically ill and I, um, had to take my sister Ola um, to Sydney hospital because she'd fought my dad off and injured her hand and needed to be checked out by a specialist there. While we were there, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go check myself in through emergency because I'm just, I'm not feeling well. I'm, I was having um, an at-risk pregnancy. And then while I'm standing there at the admissions desk, I look up and there's a poster that my mum was in with like New South Wales Multicultural Health where she did a lot of work with them. And, you know, there's this photo of her helping someone, like they're kind of sitting at a desk or something like that. And I was just like, am I seeing things? Like, <laughs> Is this real? And it was just this like bizarre moment. I didn't even think to tell the lady behind the desk because I just couldn't explain like the gravity of that, you know, that exact moment. And, um, you know, I ended up being okay. Baby was okay. But to have this like... Um, encounter with my mum in that moment, you know, for me was almost spiritual because it was this like, not just highlighting the type of person that I had now lost, but also the effect that she had on her world, the fact that she had such a broad um, impact and a reach that, you know, in this random moment, I was encountering this picture of her. So yeah, there, there were things that really started to remind me, you know, immediately after the murder that this was a loss, not just for us, but also for my whole community and that women are so multidimensional and so um, powerful in their reach and in their work and the the things that they do that often go unacknowledged that to lose one to DV is an even bigger injustice than what we initially you know, feel or sense the, the obvious part of it to actually feel that, to feel, um, the pain and the gravity of that loss. Um, yeah, it was, it was a huge thing. And I, I kept having those realizations time and time again. Yeah. Well, and, uh, the work that she did was so, so important as well, as you say, out there working, um, with people who, you know, who are, you know, from whether they're immigrants or, you know, people trying to always, assimilate to a whole new world, which she had lived experience in having, you know, come from a different country, it comes to Australia. It it must have been kind of mind blowing to do that at her age as well. And to be married to someone she didn't really know very particularly well, um, would have been difficult. Domestic violence is such a scourge on our society and every society. I mean, this is a global thing. And sadly, we talk about the the pandemic going on with COVID-19. But domestic violence in some way is a bit of a pandemic globally in the world as well. And as you say, um, that it comes, you know, it, the media likes to present this in terms of numbers, but these are human beings. These are m- more often than not women and children who are the victims of domestic violence circumstances. Did you or were you aware all the way through that? Because I know a lot of things get hidden as well, that your mother was in that level of danger from your dad? Um, The simple answer is no. I didn't 
expect and I didn't quite understand that an emotionally abusive or psychologically abusive um, relationship can actually result in or end up in fatal violence. So that link hadn't been made strongly enough, I think, for me. Um, and it's something that I think we need to equip young people to understand. And in my more recent work, that's something that I've really started to observe that it's great that we're starting to talk about it. It's great that there's an increased understanding around what coercive control can look like, how subtle and insidious abuse can be. But um, that knowledge needs to reach young people and vulnerable people who might not have access to it, you know, um, in the same way that I do. Um, when I started to reflect on the nature of my parents' relationship and read more and think more about what I did know, I started to make those links. But that was obviously after the fact. So my mum had given me hints and clues and she had, um, she had in her training learned to identify gaslighting and controlling behaviour and things like that. And she'd use those words. But no one had clearly linked that with a risk of um, violence especially when the person who is the perpetrator is someone you're familiar with, someone you get along with. I had a, what I thought was a, a normal relationship with my dad. I guess that I unpack that a little bit in the book. Um, but I had, you know, I, I thought I had a really normal um, father. I thought that my circumstances were very normal. I didn't see him as threatening in the way that she perceived him to be threatening. And that's another thing. Sometimes the, the victim, the target of the abuse, is actually the best person to, to know um, that there is an abuser and what the tactics are. And abusers are very clever at making everybody else feel like, oh, you know, they're probably exaggerating or mm, that doesn't quite fit my definition of abuse. Or, but he's a nice guy and he's like kind of a good dad, you know, all these things. And these excuses started to come up, you know, even after the murder from other people. And that's when I was like, there's such a huge disconnect between how society understands abuse and what it actually feels like in the circumstances and in my circumstances, experiencing it in such a magnified um, way on, on this big scale with, you know, a homicide having taken place. So, and, and then I started to really contextualize it and read information. And I came across a report that said that in over or about 50% of cases, there was no um, prior reports of physical violence. And then I was like, you know what, this is making more and more sense. And my dad, who didn't fit the stereotype of what an abuser would be, um, increasingly began to fit that profile for me in my head. And that really helped me understand um, the things that my mum had shared with me over the years, um, why she'd been so afraid to leave the relationship and why she'd been so nervous every time she wanted to seek a divorce and things like that. Yeah. And, um, and obviously your mum, like so many women who are in this situation, was seeing a lot of things behind closed doors that you guys didn't get to see. And although she was, as you say, hinting about it, talking about it, there was a level of fear clearly that your mum had. And you, you know, you write about that quite beautifully in the book when you start, as you say, to unpack it later. And, um, but I do think that that is so true that we are not taught in school we are not equipped with this information of what levels of violence look like and what different kinds of violence look like including gaslighting including emotional um, violence financial abuse there's a whole range of things that goes on with a lot of people um, living in domestic violence situations and very often, and, you know, I know this from lived experience myself, is that people don't see it on the outside or they're not aware that it's going on initially. Um, and as you say, like, I think even women, when they do reach out for help or when they tell a close friend or when they, if the language they use doesn't, you know, gel with what our interpretation of abuse is, that's difficult as well because, what one person sees as abuse, sadly, the media portrays as, oh, well, he was a good bloke, you know, yeah. he was a good bloke and I knew him down at the footy club or whatever it may be. I think you raise a really important, really important point there too, is that we continue to see this played over in the media um, 
all the time that the perpetrator is portrayed as a good bloke. He was a quiet guy. He kept to himself. Oh, he was a good dad. He was this, he was that. And in actual fact, he's, you know, either, you know, abused someone for a very long period of time in many forms um, or unfortunately like your mother. So many women um, lose their lives to this and this person is still portrayed in the media as being a kind of a good guy and mm-hmm. this is so unexpected. Where did this come from? Um, what are your views on, because the work that you do now is quite incredible as well and let's talk about that actually. Tell us now what your current work is. So um, on top of <laughs> making <laughs> making art and writing, and I, writing. I've been and- involved in quite a bit of <laughs> advocacy over the past few years. I volunteer on the board at the Bankstown Women's Health Centre. I love the women's health centres. I think they're an amazing resource and unfortunately very underfunded and um, always struggling and working hard to meet the needs of women in communities across our state. Um, Basically, what I do in my advocacy is not too different to what I do with my art. It's essentially storytelling and storytelling in different forums with clear intent and purpose to communicate, you know, some of the structural barriers that women face, some of the policy issues that we need to think about. Um, You know, going back to that issue of the good character and the man who's, you know, otherwise of good character. um, That's something that I've spoken about pretty often. And the New South, um, the New South Wales Sentencing Council was conducting a review of sentencing legislation around um, homicides and looking at DV homicides in particular as well. And I decided I'd kind of write a set of submissions and send that in talking about how my dad had the opportunity to present evidence about what a great guy, you know, him and his family thought him to be. And what was glaringly obvious in the courtroom then was a how insulting it is to the people who've been impacted by this crime to sit there and bear witness to essentially the the perpetrator's ego, you know, and for them to be able to, to present themselves in that light in circumstances where, you know, where, where's the victim's voice? she would disagree. She saw you in a totally different way to what you're able to now say, and we can't hear from her because she's dead. And it felt really, um, you know, important to set that out and, you know, add my voice to that conversation. I'm not even sure what ended up happening with that, but um, that's an example of the type of advocacy that I've been doing. I've also, you know, just volunteered my legal skills to boards and things like that so that, you know, rather than being um, at the front line, which is something that I I don't think I could ever do and I don't have the skills to do, I can contribute in my own way. And sometimes we all feel kind of stuck and we're like, oh, how do I help? How do I help? You can actually use your existing skill set to support an organization or to support some existing work um, in a way that's actually really valuable because they might not be able to afford, you know, legal advice on every issue. they might not be able to even have a profile within the community. So supporting your local organisations that are doing feminist work is a great way to actually help a sector that is underfunded and always looking for more resources. So for me, my advocacy has been um, multidisciplinary um, and multidimensional and connecting with different organisations, speaking publicly, speaking with young people in schools, um, and of course, writing about my experiences um, and yeah, trying to sort of push for change in whatever um, way I can. Yeah. And, and, and you know what, I think anyone who reads this book and understands what you have, you are doing now in terms of advocacy and your art, um, you know, will understand that you've taken this extraordinary kind of grief and, um, and, and turned it into something that is helping other women and other people. And I think that that's so admirable because it's a difficult thing to, to do, you know, grief in and of itself is a difficult thing to process, unpack, live with. Um, and for you and your family, you know, it was such a, a, such a sudden traumatic experience. So, um, one of the things that you did mention, um, was that when your father, uh, 
took the life of your mum, that your sister was actually there and she was trying to fend him off and she was injured uh, in that attack. Um, how is she doing? How is she coping and, and doing now? Um, she's doing pretty well now, actually. And I think when we talk about women's resilience and your recovery and your healing journey, um, it's more than just what the person can achieve on their own. It's also about what support you've had. And um, my sister has accessed um, the counselling that's been available. Um, she's worked really hard to um, recover from her particular trauma. And um, she's actually, she graduated from uni <laughs> um, just a few months ago. So she finished her degree, which is an amazing achievement, I think, to to get to the end of that, um, yeah, wow. you know, despite everything. And she's married and she was supposed to have <laughs> her wedding recently. And unfortunately, those plans were all ruined by, <laughs> by COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they oh, had an so Islamic, <laughs> they had an, thank you. We were looking forward to it. Um, they had an Islamic marriage ceremony a couple of months ago. So the formalities were done, but we were going to have a, a wedding celebration, um, this oh, weekend and oh. it's all, <laughs> it's all ruined, <laughs> but that's okay. We, we saw it coming. Um, and you know, like I said, you kind of just accept it for what it is and we'll, we'll probably have a, another sort of party eventually <laughs> at another time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so sorry, because I think, you know, oh God, I've, I've, uh, it would have been such a beautiful thing to have like a, a the ceremony, you know what I mean? The celebration. Yeah. yeah. Bang, really lovely. Yeah. So. It was going to be a good lunch. So <laughs> we've all missed out on that, but, um, <laughs> but, but she's doing well. And I think I, I'm really inspired, um, by how she's, um, firstly, by the fact that she's a total hero because she put herself in danger to fight an armed man. Oh, wow. um, and she, 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 yeah, she's definitely a hero in my eyes. And I think she's navigated all the things that we've been through um, so well. And, you know, um, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. I think um, that comes across very much in the book. You know your your absolute love for your siblings and uh, your you know she is a hero by the way. Um, that's a really difficult thing to do and to be in the middle of. And I'm so pleased that she's doing really well. And congratulations to her on finishing uni. That's extraordinary too. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and fingers crossed for you guys that you get to have that wedding celebration a little bit down the track. I hope so. We'll do something <laughs> eventually. Take some photos or something. <laughs> something <laughs> uh, yeah my um my my son we're about to postpone his 21st so I totally get like it's everywhere but um but y your family in particular I, I feel for I think that would have been such an amazing thing to do um and you know I think you write so beautifully as I said in the book about your family your love for them your siblings your brother as well and um, um and the support that you really wanted to give to everyone there's this immediate sense for you that you almost, you are the, the matriarch of the family. You've just, you know, you're just thrown into that position. Um, your strength and resilience as well. You talk about the, the strength and resilience of other women, but your strength and resilience is quite incredible, uh, Amani, and it comes through in the book and, and through your story and your love for other people. Um, how do you go through every day? What do you do to take care of yourself outside of art and writing, I guess? And how do you navigate that? Um, it's been, it's involved learning a lot of different coping strategies. So initially in the really early days, and in fact, up until the trial, I basically just dealt with things as they came up. And I didn't have a very proactive approach to my self-care to my mental health. Um, and over time I've been able to learn and add things to my toolkit that really help. So, you know, I, I immediately accepted, um, support after the murder because I just thought, well, you know, I've got to support other people and I've got to have a baby <laughs> and <laughs> I need to sort of be a little bit emotionally equipped to deal with all that. And I was, I was 26 years old, so I wasn't, I was young, you know, <laughs> um, and I had, you know, previously experienced grief. I lost my grandmother violently in 2006. Um, 
in the south of Lebanon in an Israeli drone strike, which was a huge grief for my mom. And I was starting to appreciate the magnitude of that event and how that would have affected my mom now that I had lost my mom. Um, and I needed to, to start learning how to take care of myself. So I did start think with things like journaling, taking a little bit of um, me time each day to sit and think. Um, so one of the really useful strategies that I learned was to allocate time to be angry and to have all those thoughts that are otherwise intruding all day long and you're trying to keep them at bay because you're like, I've got to focus on this, I've got to feed the baby, I've got to do that. Um, I began to allocate a time. So I'd be like, you know what, I'm really angry about this thing, but I'm going to think about it at 7 p.m. When, when the kid's down. And that was a useful strategy and something that I still do. I'm like, I'm going to talk, I'm going to think about that a little bit later. I'll write about it a little bit later. And now I'll just focus on this one task. Um, that was extremely valuable. But since then, I've also, you know, built up my creative practice. So that is there for me. I've got like over 20 house plants. <laughs> You're a plant mom. <laughs> I'm a plant mom. I now have a cat as well. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's another thing to look after. Um, I think when you're kind of engaging with your surroundings and doing kind of nurturing things, you're thinking about the future. It's a very forward thinking thing to do. And that kind of creates a bit of hope. Um, and you know, I, the experience of writing the book meant that I had to revisit a lot of that trauma and think about it again and be triggered by it and have nightmares and go through that process. But I was, you know, having engaged in counseling for a long time, having to built up my support network and my routine and my habits, um, really helped me get to the end of that task and experience the, you know, the, the sense of reward that comes with that. So whilst it was a difficult process, now that it's done, I really do feel, that sense of relief that writing can bring. And immediately after submitting my manuscript, I went away on a retreat <laughs> with an organization called Hope and Heal literally the next day. And it had just worked out that way. Um, so I went on a yoga retreat, learned a lot about the neuroscience of trauma, um, equipped with myself with some new coping mechanisms, breathing techniques, um, and things like that. So it's, it's a fluid process. You're always learning how to cope better and how to be resilient. And you can't always be resilient. Some days you just got to accept like today, I'm not able to do this. I'm going to have a break and I'm going to just let things go for a little while, which is so hard for women to do when they have so many responsibilities. But um, I, I've been lucky to be able to access a lot of different types of support. And I think that's been, you know, crucial in my journey. Um. I just wanted to ask because your story is obviously it's so powerful, but I was wondering if your family has actually read the book and if they have, how did they respond to it? So my husband and both my sisters have read it. They read it in the proof form um, before it came out and they all loved it, which is like a huge relief, I think, for a writer writing such a personal experience and wondering, you know, am I the only one who sees things this way or is this relatable? Is this accurate? Is this capturing that moment? And for both of my sisters to message me and say, like my sister, Noor, who lives in Canberra, messaged me and said, I've just finished this and it is my favorite book. And I'm like so proud that my sister has written my favorite book. And Ola was like, you've captured things that we haven't even talked about. So that for me was a huge compliment because to be able to do that with your writing in a way where, you know, you're creating empathy with another person's experience, but you, you might not have lived it, um, I think is a very powerful thing. So it was a huge relief. Sorry. It was a huge relief to hear from them when they'd read it. And then I was like, okay, it can go into the world now. <laughs> I'm happy. And my, my husband loved it too. And he actually went out the other day. I haven't seen it on shelves yet because we've been in lockdown. I've seen it in photos, but not actually in the shops. But he was in Parramatta and he walked past the Dimmicks and he bought a copy because it had the sticker, the book of the month, <laughs> nonfiction book of month sticker on it. He brought it over to me, even though we have like 10 copies at home. <laughs> he's like, I want you to sign this one. <laughs> so he's, he's been great too. And I mean, as for my extended family, I'm sure there are people out there who are not happy that I've written a book and you know, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, they can buy it. They can not buy it. It's totally up to them. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that the, the people who I really care about and whose you know opinion means the most to me um have loved it and that's that's amazing 
Well, congratulations, Amani, and I'm so thrilled for you that the book's been so yep. well received, especially in bookstores. That is so cool, and I love that your hubby brought a book home for you. That is so great. Um, I really wanted to say thank you, huge big thank you for sharing your incredible story um, and your book with the world and for doing so with such raw and powerful honesty. I think you are extraordinary um, and I thank you for your advocacy work, especially for other women going through domestic violence situations. Um, we will put the links up, for, obviously, for your thank books you. in the show notes um, and where people can actually go to look at your beautiful art because you're pretty amazing. Um, it was just so brilliant to meet you today. Thank you. And um, thank you for being on the Good Girl Confessional. Um, it, it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandy. That means a lot. And I'm grateful for every reader who picks it up and engages with it because that kind of means that I'm, you know, carrying less because I'm sharing it with more people. And that for me is very valuable and such an empowering thing. Yeah. Thanks, Amani. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is brought to you by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine, available now at wb40.com. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to quality podcasts. We're also now available on YouTube. We chat with really interesting women about their hard-won wisdom, but it really helps us if you can subscribe, like, and share share the podcast. Thanks so much for your support. Bye for now.